just want to take a, a quick moment to say thanks to the ScaleConf organizers for this amazing conference. I've enjoyed a lot of the talks. I specifically want to say thank you for putting me second last on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> and actual thanks for putting Nina and Facebook after me to keep you all here. <laughs> so this slide's quite interesting. Um, innovation at scale, the enterprise renaissance with the uh, city site seeing bus on it. When I uh, submitted my talk submission, I wanted to go with as much romance and, and bling and just to try and get in here. And I'm not sure whether I got in because of that or because of the coffee sponsorship. But one of the topics I used or themes I used in my submission was the red bus tour through Pain Point Pass. If you'd read the talk descriptions on the ScaleConf site, you would have seen that. So when I was actually putting my slides together, I rather regretted this uh, verbal diarrhea of romantic terms, renaissance. But I thought I'd stick it in here because they might invite me back next time if I stick to what I say I'm going to say. But right, let's get, let's get into it. Uh, who knows the Red Bus Tour? First, let's just see a show of hands who's from out of town today. Well, welcome to our beautiful city. Most of them are from overseas, so I see we, we don't see many Joburgers here today. But Joburg also has a red bus tour. I don't know if ever, any of you have been on it. What happens on the red bus tour is you get on, it's hop on, hop off, and it takes you through interesting parts of the city, and you get headphones with a, a really interesting audio track. I thought it would be boring and, and sta stock standard, but I found it really interesting when I went on it. And so today, I'm going to take you through a, a bit of a tour through some of the things we're doing at Alan Gray. Um, to enable innovation at scale. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, I, I went out to Cape Point. One of the Red Bus Tour routes is called the Cape Point Adventure. It takes you down to Cape Point. And I thought I was going to be very excited because I was going to go to the most southern point of South Africa because my geography was terrible. But you'll see over there, it says the most southwestern point of the African continent. <laughs> I feel that's reaching for an accolade. <laughs> the real most southern point is Cape Agulhas. I also thought the two oceans actually joined at Cape Point, seeing as the Two Oceans Aquarium is in Cape Town, not in uh, Cape Agulhas. And, and you can see the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, you, well, you can't see. There's, there's a, maybe you can see the Atlantic Ocean's on the left of Cape Agulhas and the Indian Ocean on the right. But it turns out when you get there, you can't see that. <laughs> so Cape Agulhas gets the... the the title of being uh, where the two oceans meet because the International Hydrographic Organization says, from the coast of the Antarctic continent northwards along the meridian of the 20 degrees east to Cape Agulhas, um, that's the definition of the Indian Ocean. Right. Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, just in case you were like me and didn't really know, that's, that's the exact line. So I'm Robert Herbst, I work at Alan Gray, and when you go out and do a conference talk from Alan Gray, they do a glamour photo shoot with you. <laughs> uh, this is the, my only photo that I took in this slide deck, um, so I'm just going to take a moment for you to appreciate its beauty. I work for the dark side. As, as was earlier referred in one of the talks. We, we are slightly corporate, but we're not really like this. We're more like this. <laughs> right, and today I'm going to be talking about innovation at scale. But before we delve into that, I want to just clarify what I mean about innovation today and what we're trying to help Ellen Gray achieve. Um, so what is innovation? Uh, I did a lot of research to try and get a clear definition. I, made the, uh, I was confused between innovation and uh, invention. So just to clarify what innovation is in my point of view, um, here's some definitions. To make changes in something established, especially, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. Another one is turning an idea into a solution that adds value from a customer's perspective. Uh, this is from a, a list of uh, experts who asked what do they think innovation is, and another question they were asked is where do companies get it wrong? And this expert said, companies get it wrong by thinking it's an internal value, but not optimizing for the value that you provide to your clients. So you can be innovating internally, but if you're not providing value to your clients, the innovation isn't valuable as a business. A final definition, the, the introduction of new products and services that add value to the organization. 
A common theme through all of these is, is value, new value, right? And that's what I want to focus on as innovation today, the ability to add new value or the process of adding new value. And then I want to talk about at what scale, because technically this is a scale. You know, scale could be anything you define it to be, small scale, large scale. Um, so to give you an idea, if we start with bedroom scale on the left-hand side there, where you're not really worrying about making your service meet the traffic you're getting, you move up a bit to the spirit of scale. Uh, if you look at the top, there's a, a roughly associated number of team, uh, developers or team members working on the product. So at the spirit of scale level, you're two to three people. You need to make decisions that aren't going to limit you let down the line. You need to make decisions that should you need to scale, you haven't locked yourself out of that. You move up a little bit to like, I need to scale, scale, it's about five to 10 employees. Then I think we've got this. We're growing comfortably, you've got about 25 employees. You get up to, how could I be so wrong scale? It's about 25 employees. And just to, to, to give you a bit of scale, that's, that's WordPress. <laughs> All right, so where I'm gonna be focusing is here by this green area, once you've, you, you've you understand your business, you've been innovating, you've achieved a margin of success, but you're struggling to innovate on top of that. So I don't know how far towards WordPress these tips are going to carry you or where you'll start to need other tips and other practices, but it's somewhere in that range. Not all the way up here where you're playing with Facebook and WordPress levels, but on businesses that are successful and are trying to maintain their rate of innovation. So it's a fallacy that adding more people in is a linear growth path to uh, output, right? This is more likely. The more people you add, the more coordination you have to have, and the slower your rate of output. So I want to talk about innovating from a place of success, um, where you've gotten it right to innovate to a place where customers want what you want, or what you're providing, and you start to get fans, and you're starting to have something to lose. So that's success. Right about there, and you start hiring more people to try and increase your growth, and you're struggling to keep up the growth that you started your company with. If you keep along this uh, path, you end up at the grave of innovation, maintaining what the status quo is. The, the best way to keep a system stable is not to change it. So this talk is mostly about trying to change this graph into this graph. As you add more people, your output and your innovation and the value you provide is not going to be at a linear scale. But if you follow some of the things I'm going to mention today, I hope that you'll be able to smooth out the curve of that graph for a longer period of time. All right, so that the three main topics I want to dive into today are the ability to deliver quickly, the culture to create, and the practice of deploying cheaply. And this is where our red bus tour kicks off. I'm going to take you through a part, uh, a couple of practices we're doing. You, you might think they're strange. I'll give you a bit of overview, and I'll try and explain how they relate back to smoothing that growth curve. But let's start with the, the ability to deliver quickly. Why is it important to be able to deliver quickly? Well, great ideas tend to stagnate and disappear if they get added to a bottom of a backlog that will take six years to get to. The ability to deliver quickly allows you to get these these what you think are great ideas in front of customers quickly to assert, assess whether they really are innovative and whether they do have value. You will never know if you never put it in front of your customers. All right, uh, oh sorry, I put up legacy systems. I ran this, this talk at work the other day and we have a couple of teams who I refer to as legacy systems. They said we're established, not legacy. <laughs> but let's talk about established systems for a while. Established systems are carrying the success of your business. They're there, they helped you reach the stage, and they're providing value. They're doing something for you. If they weren't, you could get rid of them, right? But there's a lot of value baked up into these sometimes older systems, systems that are hard to adapt to modern development practices and workflows. So what do we want to do? We want to break the coupling of delivering new features and value from uh, the coupling to these legacy systems. And I propose that we start thinking of legacy systems as providing capabilities. Isolate the capability or the concept of a capability that the legacy system provides from the implementation. And once you start working towards capabilities and not implementations, you gain the ability to swap out the implementation at a later stage. All right, so Start wrapping your capabilities in services. I used to have microservices in here, but it was the only buzzword I had, and I worked really hard to get it out. So if you want, you can see wrap your capabilities in microservices. 
So you might have one big legacy system that provides both uh, customer relationship modeling as well as interaction tracking. Those are separate capabilities that you can wrap up in separate services, which allows you down the line to swap out the implementations into true microservices. So why is this important? Well, if you have to wait for the legacy system to update and to add features for you, uh, you're not going to be able to deliver the feature relying on those capabilities quickly. Right? And if you're building towards implementations and not capabilities, when it comes time to extend the capability, you're going to be extending the implementation instead of the capability. If you have wrapped your capability behind a microservice um, or a major service, you can start adding those capabilities outside of the legacy system in a way that is easy to track, test, and deploy, which will allow you to deliver more quickly. Right, and when you start delivering new capabilities, think of them in the same way. Don't code to the implementation, code to the interface, right? This is an object-oriented principle that I found a lot of them map to what we're doing now on a larger scale. But code to the capability and make sure your capabilities are connected but not coupled. We spoke earlier about um, emitting events out into the system. Uh, so let's take an example here. Instead of coupling uh, a user information system to a, a user update portal, let the user update portal emit events saying that a user did update their systems and let the user information system act on that in its own way. It decouples the system and you can think of the capability as user update and user information storage. And don't be greedy, right? So share, these, share the valid information across the systems. You don't know what another system might want from you. The easiest way to broadcast things so that other systems can use them is to broadcast them, right? If you require another system to reach into you, and then you need to provide the, the, the abilities that they're looking for. If they can do it themselves inside their system and it doesn't fall inside your capabilities domain, they should be able to. And emitting events through something like RabbitMQ and async interface allows systems to do that. And then, optimize for the rate of change, right? So, We've already looked at legacy systems and we know they move more slowly than newer, uh, newer smaller systems. So it doesn't make any sense to couple new smaller systems to the old legacy systems. But just as that doesn't make sense, it probably doesn't make sense to expect your legacy teams to deploy every night on every commit. They might not even have source control. There are some legacy systems that are providing value to your business that don't have Git or SVN. To expect them to be have a, a full automated test suite and deploy on every commit, which doesn't exist in this stage, would lead to madness. So be aware that there are differing rates of change, right? And we've come to see that the rate of change correlates to the proximity to the user. To elaborate a bit more on that, systems that are closer to users tend to change faster than systems that are core dependencies. There's various reasons for this. First and foremost, core systems have a lot of dependencies, and they need to coordinate their changes so they won't break anyone downstream. But systems closer to users have users knocking on their door, and if you make a mistake there, it's much more likely that a user is going to want to change faster. And given that you are at the edge, close to the user, you don't have any, core, you don't have any dependencies on you other than users, and they're very adaptable. The one caveat to this, or the exception, is public API gateways, which are close to a user, but not necessarily the user of the consumers of your gateway. So be careful if you put in a public API gateway to be aware that you're adding a core system for other users on the edge of your network, where traditionally you have high rate of change. So what does optimizing for rate of change look like? I'm going to give a high-level overview of our new web stack at Alan Gray and how we've optimized for change, the rate of change. Now, at the back, we've got core systems. We've got CRM systems, our financial transaction systems, and these are slow beasts that are slow to change. Spinning up a new instance of these can take days at a time. We can't do this on a CI build. Right? We've wrapped these in a services layer, a microservices layer, exposing capabilities, but microservices tend to get dependencies on them as you go up there. We've got some core microservices and some more higher level microservices. And as you move closer to the user, we were forced to use JavaScript in the browser. And the rate of change is very high. But we slotted in a layer between our API platform and the client called the BFF, which does not stand for best friends forever. 
This is probably the, the worst acronym that we've chosen for our systems. It stands for backend for a frontend. The idea with a backend for a frontend is that you have a small gateway server that can optimize network traffic to its consumer. A mobile application and a rich desktop application and a web application all have different requirements. So we've put in this layer that allows us a measure of flexibility for rates of change between our retail APIs, our API platform, and our clients. Um, the API platform does move more slowly because it has more dependencies. And another uh, approach we've taken is to, teams own, uh, should own their whole stack, but it's much easier to, to change things that nobody else depends on. Right, so the changes that they want to get out quickly, they can adapt to the, the shortcomings in the API layer by doing that work inside the gateway layer, and then when time comes to release the API layer, it moves backwards into the core layer and gets removed from that layer, allowing the client to serve that capability more um, faster. Right, another approach, uh, let me go back to this uh, optimizing for rate of change. How does this help innovation? This helps teams who need to move quickly to be able to move quickly. This allows you to verify uh, your assumptions without needing to change your core systems. They move slowly, uh, Angular apps on the, uh, on the border might be able to iterate faster. Right. Use tools as value multipliers and avoid reinventing the wheel. I'd like to go into this a bit further because this is uh, my core competency um, in Ellen Gray. You will reach a certain stage with employees where the most value that you can add is to empower other teams. If every team is churning and solving the same problems, you're wasting a lot of effort. So you'll reach a certain stage where it makes sense for your company to put together a team that can empower other teams, right? And this is where building tools as value multipliers comes in. If you have a team that can take care of cross-cutting concerns and allow other teams to focus on problem areas, you speed them up dramatically. They have to think less about infrastructure and tooling and authorization and the boring things in their minds because it's all there. This does not mean the teams don't need to understand their tools. It just means they don't need to build them. So some examples of uh, using tools as value multipliers is a living style guide. So what is a living style guide? I'd like to dive into it a little bit because it's one of the most exciting tools we're working with at the moment. If you have seen a living style guide, I, th I, I think you'll appreciate its beauty. See, a lot of companies have style guides to maintain the consistency of user interface across their applications. A living style, but the downside of style guides is they very quickly uh, diverge from what's actually out there. If a team needs a user interface element and it's not in the style guide, they create it and don't necessarily port it back to the style guide. A living style guide is built using the components it defines. So let's take a, a more concrete example of React components. If we're building a lot of single page applications based on React components, we build our living style guide out of the React components that there's, they're defining. It's a bit recursive, but what it means is that if there's an element in the style guide, there's a code implementation for it. Right? So if there's an element in the style guide, you know you can use it. And we've combined the implementation library and the rule library into one asset. When they move, they move in check. When you update the style guide, you get the latest rules. This does lead to a lot of complications because you might need to build multiple implementations. Right? React, though, is quite a powerful language for us. It's allowed us to render in many places, including mobile, on the server, and in the browser. Another example of a living style guide is Lonely Planet. They've built a great living style guide. They're a Ruby-based company, so they use Ruby templating. But they've exposed their Ruby templating over an HTTP interface so that other consumers can get static representations of their style guide. The important thing is that your style guide drives your user interface design. This decouples your user interface development from the product that you're building. There's all these reusable tools that are consistent, so you get consistency across your systems, that you don't have to think about. There will be times when teams need to add to this. The approach I would recommend is, because it's a living style guide, they develop the user interface that they need inside the style guide and then consume it from the applications. Right, other things as horizontal concerns, tools we've provided for our teams include logging, security, authorization, 
You've seen um, that we have a gateway layer written in Express. So we've provided them with Express middleware that takes away some of the concerns for them. When they go to session management, they either need to go look through all the NPM packages or they can just use this tool we've given them that we've guaranteed works with our systems. And doing this, I believe, provides cheap excellence if you get it right. If you can provide tools that by your teams using them deliver an excellent result, you'll get excellence cheaply, as long as your tools are enticing to use. Right? If tools provide value to your teams, so much value that they'd be stupid not to use them, then they will use them. There's a tension when you start uh, creating teams to empower other teams. Where do you draw the line between enforcement and governance and recommendations? See, when you have a team that can maintain all these cross-cutting concerns, the natural incl inclination is for you to try and, if you make a change to those cross-cutting concerns, to change it everywhere. What this does, though, as a knock-on effect, is it removes the ownership of that part of the system from the team writing it. And as we'll get into it a bit later, I believe explicit ownership is important. So I've come to realize that when you're building tools as uh, value multipliers, your goal should be to make them so valuable and easy to use that the teams want to adopt them, not to force the teams to use them because they immediately shut off and say, well, that's your responsibility. You told me to do it. All right, and now we get to um, my part of the world, platform. All right, so I am a platform engineer at Alan Gray, and for those of you who are confused about that, we'll get into what that is. Um, the platform frees teams from making decisions unrelated to their problem. What does a platform look like for us? It's a very rough diagram abstract, but our platform started with our architecture. I'm speaking specifically now to a platform that works on uh, our new web stack. So we went through a, a long thinking process and evaluation process to come up with a web architecture that we believe will be flexible enough for our teams to use. In our case, it happened to be a React, a React stack, and there's a lot of moving parts with a React stack that you need to provide. So we went through the upfront effort to evaluate against the use cases what parts of the React stack we should be using. Again, so we provide this as a skeleton project to our teams with all the um, recommended tools in it. The teams are free to make changes to that, but they must do so acknowledging that they are taking ownership of that part of the stack into their own hands. Explicit ownership is a very powerful but dangerous thing. You know, great power comes with great responsibility. Right. Our platform started with the architecture. We put together a list of uh, prescribed libraries that we think you should use, React, Redux. We gave you some startup scripts, some basic examples of how to do things so that when you're coming to solve your problem, you don't need to figure out how to make a web request. The next thing we started on was cross-cutting services and exposing these to this, this application. We provided a way for logging, for authentication, and for monitoring. Again, you plug into these low cost to integrate, and you get great value. The teams use these by default. If they wanted to, they could swap them out, but there's so much value here for free that as a team consuming our skeleton project, you get monitoring as a default. Another element we saw pretty early on over here, the testing harness. So in an attempt to make tools as easy to use as possible, we found that the testing story around React applications was not mature to a level we desired. We've got a lot of testing team members who are used to writing automation tests against web applications using Selenium-style uh, language, where you would say, click this, fill in this, assert this. React didn't have that at the time. So we, as a platform engineering team, decided we are going to take this on. It's been painful, but it's allowed our testers to test the way they want to in a language they understand. Again, great value that comes for free with the platform. They are free to change it, but it, they get so much value by using it. And then finally, we started looking at application components that every team needs. And if you look over here, we've got the drop dropdown. Uh, this is like a UI dropdown, which we're going to be providing through a living style guide. Given this, the teams have a lot of tools at their disposal so that when they have an idea and want to build it out, build out a prototype, They've got them, they're ready for them. They don't have to do that thinking up front. How does this relate to innovation? Well, I think it's obvious. You've got the idea, you need to build something to evaluate it. Your build time has been reduced dramatically. The second part of my larger team is delivery. So we've got a delivery engineering team as well, which I think is what a lot of other companies are calling DevOps. 
I'll get to a slide later of my opinion of DevOps or my impression that I think cleared it up for me. But our, Dev our, del our DevOps team, <laughs> our delivery engineering team aims to reduce the overhead of getting software in front of users. What does that look like for us? So as a delivery engineering team, the team provides an, a, a, an explicit interface that if teams subscribe to that, they can get build process and into production, right? It so happens that our explicit interface consists of a couple of GitLab configuration files to power your continuous integration and a Docker file um, to, to describe what your running service should look like in production. Those two things put together, along with an application name and a repository on GitLab, means that on every commit you make, you get a build that runs through the build phase, a test phase, a verify phase, and then if it passes that, publishes into our Docker repository. If you set up your, um, your, configure, your deployment configuration file correctly, you can get launched into our Kubernetes cluster with a click of a button. Go back a slide. This removes the overhead of getting software in front of users. So how does this help innovation? Again, it allows you to focus on the problem at hand as a team using this. The more we can take the, the overhead off of teams, the more they can iterate and innovate on their ideas. I'll move on to the next main topic, the culture to create. We've given the teams the tools. Now we need to make sure that they are able to innovate using them. So here's the slide I was talking about. Things have changed dramatically in software development practices over the last years. This slide put into context more than any other for me what the DevOps movement is about. And this is just my strong opinion. But back in the day we had waterfall where every part of the process was in isolation. We came forward to Agile where we included business and testing into the loop along with requirements. But we still left out delivery and operations and DevOps puts the entire thing into your, your product team. Right? This allows you as a product team to move faster because I firmly believe if something goes wrong in production, the most likely person to know how to fix it is the person who built the product you put into production. We've put in the isolation for good reason between uh, operations and the development teams and there are a lot of development teams who don't want that responsibility. But I'd wager that if you've worked in a bigger company with operations and something goes wrong and sirens are going off, those hard walls tend to blur a little bit. When this production service is down, you tend to sit next to an operations guy to get things done. So why not put that operations guy in your team? Right? But it's a big change for a lot of teams. And I'll, I'll hock them back to the, the, the slide on optimizing for rate of change. Big, slow-moving systems are very focused on their system and might not want this level of, of responsibility or need the level of flexibility that it provides. And optimizing for rate of change means that some teams adopt a DevOps approach and some teams maybe still go through a waterfall approach. If you don't have source control, you need very good specifications up front and evaluations down the line. But something that the DevOps movement and Agile more has made clear to me that this division between business and IT that evolves in uh, existing established companies, which I feel and hope and seem to see that uh, digital native companies are immune to, is a separation between business and IT. In existing companies, business has sprouted up before IT became a thing. For instance, Alan Gray has been around for 40 years. They didn't have an IT department back when they started. They had people, people, relationships, and people skills. As time has gone on, Digital natives are starting up inside IT, right? They have no concept of what is business and what is IT. But more traditional, established, successful companies ex uh, created IT as a capability to support the business. Now is the time when these companies are realizing that they're at risk against these digital natives, right? If you'd speak to any of the established financial uh, institutions in South Africa, they're looking at fintech startups, wondering, which one of them might eat our breakfast? So there's a big movement, and this is why I called it the enterprise renaissance, to try and establish this ability to innovate and deliver quickly inside these companies. And this is, a, this is a big change for them, right? Because it's not just technology that lives in digital natives. It's this mindset of being able to iterate quickly and evaluate. Are my assumptions correct? The quickest I can disprove my assumption, the quicker I can try another one. The fact that we have a separation between business and IT means that it takes a long time to form assumptions and uh, uh, verify them. 
Right, so business is IT, and this is the big cultural change that a lot of companies are going through. But again, you have some teams and some people who will struggle with change. There are people who would much rather just build to spec and then hand it over to IT ops. Right? And there's a lot of business people who still see IT as the people who come and fix their laptops. But this is something you need to change. I believe you need to change if you want to innovate quickly. Right, and explicit ownership from idea to delivery. I spoke about this earlier. For a team to be able to come up with an idea, iterate on it, validate it, and put it in front of users, I think is immensely valuable for innovation. And to do this with as few hurdles and roadblocks in their path, I think is obvious. Right? The more roadblocks and hurdles you have to face, the less likely you're going to be to push through your, your, your idea into, into production in front of the users. And if it's your idea in front of the users, you're going to care more about it. If running your services in production is not your responsibility, why would you care about it? You're second line, right? The operations guys first need to get hold of me. If it's mine, I'm going to put up a totem pole because this reflects on me. I'm going to see what's going on. I'm going to care. One thing that's important for teams moving into the space is to provide them the ability to fail safely. What does failing safely look like? Well, it could be a various number of things. But allow them to iterate and, and experiment in safe spaces. One way to do this is through targeted releases. And I put a subtext there to be controlled by the team. Right? Give the team the ability to put something in front of a small set of safe users and experiment with this process. They're going to learn how to release often, they're going to learn how to make small changes, and it's going to go wrong. This is talking in the context of teams who haven't done this before, and I get the feeling that there's a lot of people here who this seems like common sense to. But as I say, you, these established businesses are at that stage where they're, oh, how could I be so wrong about innovation? All right, but again, along with explicit ownership comes the, the need to verify outcomes of your assumptions, the ability to do so, but even more importantly, I think, optimizing recovery. We got a great example of, of a company who optimizes recovery greatly the other day when S3 went down. To be fair, they were down really, really short. It was quite a major outage, and Amazon recovered elegantly. This is because Amazon practices recovering very often. Like, they know how to get their systems back into an operational state. If you haven't practiced this and things go wrong, how quickly can you get your system back up and running? So optimizing for recovery is important, I believe. And then the last key ability that you need to provide teams is to verify system health through automated tests. This is a big one for big, extensive systems that exist already. It's hard to automate entire systems. Newer software platforms allow you to spin up entire environments and head against them. But when you're working with legacy systems that take three days to establish a cluster, it is hard. But go as far as you can to make sure that a team can very quickly know if what they've done has influenced other teams. And then the last thing I want to nail on is practice deploying cheaply. What does practice deploying cheaply entail? Well, usually a lot of mess. Right? It takes time to see past this mess. There's a lot of techniques and, and requirements for you to deploy regularly that teams are not going to be used to if they haven't done it before. This idea experiment validate process is unfamiliar a lot of the time. All right, so one of the big things to, uh, to practicing deploying often is decoupling release from deployment. I would hope that many people here know that release and deployment are two separate things. Deployment is getting code into production. Release is turning it on for users. The moment you've decoupled those two, you can start pushing code into production and exposing small sets of functionality to users without turning it onto the broader base. Four or five years ago, I, I was reading up how GitHub does this. And there are still companies who are not doing it today. But four or five years ago, I was like, damn, that would be cool if I could do that. And today we're doing it, right? This is immensely powerful. But it takes a lot of mindset change. When you're working with a, a, a monthly release cycle to say, I want to go every night, who's going to verify that it's fine? No, no, it's off. Like that's a, that's a bit of a, a mindset change. But to release often to production, you need to be prepared to go often. This is often where teams trip up. Keeping a, a branch or a release version in a state that can always go to production is crucial if you want to optimize, optimize mean time to recovery. I highly advocate for trunk-based development. Right, this is going to be tough for a lot of people to swallow, and there's going to be differing opinions. And if you want to come and tell me I'm wrong, I would appreciate to hear it. But 
one thing that trunk-based development gives us is a very fast integration cycle, right? For those who don't know what trunk-based development is, um, if you're using Git and you've used Git flow, you have feature branches will come off, you'll merge back onto a develop branch, you'll merge back onto a master branch when you're ready to release, you'll tag your release, and then you'll be able to do hot fixes on that release branch or off of your master branch. Master branch represents production. It's, it's quite complicated, actually, right? So trunk-based development says, you maintain one branch that is always ready to go to production. If your commit comes back, you, you do branch off for features, but you merge back as fast as possible. Feature doesn't actually have to be complete as long as your merge back onto master doesn't break the system. If the system can re remain in a healthy state, there's no reason you can't get back onto master sooner. What this allows is maybe not people who want to use your functionality to get it faster, but if you've made changes to shared functionality, they will get it faster. A common rebuttal to this is, I'm working on a feature branch, I'm merging in my master branch the whole time, there's small changes when I merge back onto master. Apart from that other guy who was also doing that and now has to take your large merge before he can merge back into master. Small, frequent merges reduce risk and increase understanding and are much easier to think about. This is why I think trunk-based development is crucial to maintaining velocity. Right, to recap. I believe we should try and provide the ability to deliver quickly to our teams. This way they can get their ideas in front of customers quicker to, ver to verify whether their assumptions are correct. I do believe that there is going to be a culture to create that needs to be instilled in teams and in companies. Without the culture to create, teams don't take explicit ownership, they don't innovate. And I believe you need to practice deploying cheaply so that you can do it often and when you need to. Right, and the tips I gave you today or the practices I feel play in this space, right? You've got an established company, you've got a big team going and you're starting to lose momentum and innovation. We're trying to change this graph into something that looks like this. That's it for me. Any questions? Uh, you were talking about uh, this trunk-based development where you keep uh, committing back to the master trunk as uh, fast as possible. How would that differ from maybe using something like continuous integration? So continuous integration can actually happen on many different branches, right? So continuous integration, in my opinion, in my understanding, is when you when you commit and merge to a branch, it gets built and verified. So when you integrate with anything, those tests get, those tests get run and the, the validity of the code gets verified. Trunk base says you only do that on one branch. Right? That's, that's the next step. So I could be integrating with other people on a feature branch, testing that, but there could be a different team, team who has no idea about what's going on on my feature branch. So by trunk base putting everybody on the same branch, those, everybody gets exposed to those quickly. It is a form of continuous integration, but it's a very strict form of continuous integration. Hi. Um, if you have a team that's developing tools for other teams, how do you go about sourcing requirements for those tools? And how do you go about testing that tool for all the use cases in which the other teams will use and abuse those tools? I think that's a very important part of getting this right. We are very lucky to live on the same floor as these other teams, um, and we interact with them heavily. I think the only way is to discuss with teams to understand what they're going to be building, to try and get an idea of what tools might be missing, and if you provide them with tools, make sure you do get feedback. One, make sure your tools are being used, because that is a success criteria. If you're building tools no one's using, then you're getting it wrong. And two, make sure teams are happy with the tools or they're deriving value. They might not think it's perfect, but if the outcome is better, then it's definitely worth it. But keep in touch with the teams. Luckily, this isn't a throw it over the wall to them either. They are effectively our clients, and we want to get things in front of them and verify very quickly. Yes, yeah, so I was just wondering, you're doing trunk-based development. What are you using to gate change onto your master so that you don't get bad commits, which presumably cause a fair amount of blast radius? 
So we do have builds on feature branches that will check against its understanding of what master is. But we, what's important, the most important thing is not to get a bad commit into production. Right, so once you go into master, we do have existing gates after that to verify the system. But the final pushes out of development environments is always going to be manual. And I won't pretend that we've got a, a, the test suite 100% right. I believe it's incredibly important. And it's, it's the onion approach, right? You do as much as you can where you can. The flip side is optimizing mean time to recovery. So if you do get a bad commit into master, you need to be able to fix it quickly and not have to wait for next weekend's release. Hi. Um, regarding trunk-based development, um, do you still use pull requests to do peer reviews, or do you have a different system to handle that? We do use pull, uh, pull requests to do peer reviews, but we are looking at other methods of it as well. We do encourage, so we have a guideline that any code going to production must be peer reviewed. Uh, pull request is one of those ways to do it. But when you move into a world of merging onto master with an incomplete feature, that gets a bit difficult. There's actually been studies shown that Code reviews done earlier in the process provide a lot more value. The study in question looked at three, three times where you could do code review. One, just after you've done a design to evaluate whether you understand the design correctly. Two, in the middle of implementing the design. And three, where we currently do uh, code reviews in the open source model, which is a pull request. They actually found that in the third position, there was negative value derived if they had implemented the first two because the costs of fixing something once you've already written it and provided tests is really expensive. So I'd encourage you to be doing code reviews earlier on, but the pull request does provide a nice atomic unit to be reviewed, especially when you're working on somebody else's project that isn't under your explicit ownership. That way you can protect a master branch with commit access from only the team that owns it. Um, is there a path from your trunk-based development to continuous deployment? Yes, there's definitely a path. Um, I think that's the whole goal with trunk-based uh, trunk development. But given the industry we work in, I don't think we'll ever get to continuous deployment. We always want a person in the way. But let me not speak on behalf of my company. But um, they are definitely, that's, that's the approach a lot of people use to get to continuous deployment. Keeping on master branch and hiding behind feature flags or whatever. Right. With your team providing um, services to other teams, it seems like you also prescribe the technology choices, the, the specific languages. Or were all the other teams okay to accept your choices, or did you, how did you go about the politics of that? Can I plead the fifth? <laughs> Again, this is something that a team like this is naturally going to, to work with. We're really trying to take the approach of providing so much value that it's a non-brainer, like it's a no-brainer. If we say we've got 80% of our tools that provide value based on this stack, and you want to provide your own stack, teams who use our stack will naturally move faster than teams who don't. Right, so that's one way to get around it. The other way is there are certain hard lines that we've drawn, just because we are establishing new teams. And it depends on your team's maturity. If there's a super mature team who knows that the tools you provided them are not the right tools for the job, I don't believe you should stand in the way of them implementing that but they must accept that it's their responsibility then to look after what they've built and it's their known cost to not accept the value you're providing at a low cost. They need to weigh up that, that cost. Okay. Um, yeah, hi. This isn't really a question, it's just an attempt to win the reader card. And uh, in terms of the um, living style guide, um, what does the process look like when you are maintaining that on an ongoing basis? Because that's something that's typically kind of static and thrown over the wall from a branding department or some other person in the company. Um, what does that feedback loop look like? I, I can't pretend that we've solved this 100% yet, but. What I do see the Living Style Guide as is a big enough tool to empower the teams that it might be worth establishing its own team. Your interface design is going to be defined by your branding department because it's across many different outlooks. So they definitely weigh in on the Style Guide. But there's a team building it that includes designers and developers. 
it, it's very similar to our team. It just is a big enough problem that it can require its own team. Again, the, the concern with the living style guide for me is it's the one solid line we're drawing in the sand saying you have to use, you have to abide by these rules. So it might be a, a gatekeeper to innovation in case you need to do something that these rules don't cater for, but we'd like to achieve 80% coverage so that you don't need to think about it. If there's a rule for it, you don't need to think about it. Um, with modern businesses and when they start adopting Agile, they, the business side understands that they can change feature priorities often. When you start partially developing features and pushing it to master and business decides to change their mind, how do you go about cleaning up half-built features and not having a large graveyard of semi-built features? Yeah, I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cost to pay if you start doing any sort of partial features or hidden features. Uh, one of the big techniques we employ is feature flags. Knowing when to go remove a feature flag requires a lot of discipline. One thing that I, I would advocate for is having business as much as possible inside the team and knowing what's going on in terms of that. One of the recommendations we have for teams if you're going to be doing this approach is to extract the split in behavior as high as possible. If you're adding a new page to an uh, application or a new view, extract the split on deciding whether it's visible as high as possible, that you can remove that whole thing quite easily. What you don't want to be doing is embedding those decisions everywhere in the code because then it's hard to clean up. If you can reach one point where you can turn it on or off, then I think you're succeeding and it's easy to clean up. But clean up does require discipline and we have thought through some approaches of smart feature toggles that can keep track of when they've never been false, you know, to, and, and to know when they should be addressed. But really, this is an explicit team ownership thing. We can come in and enforce it, or we can expect teams to own it for themselves. The more dead features they're carrying in their code base, the slower they're going to move when they need to clean it up. Uh, in a similar vein, how do you decide when to move uh, a new feature that you quickly developed in the BFF layer down to the API layer? At risk of stepping into company policy, um, I think our clear rule is that the, the API layer contains our business logic. Once you've got something in a BFF, it's only exposed to one client. If it's something that should be reused and consistent across the company, that needs to move up. And usually what will happen is we'll actually move it up immediately and we'll stop using the BFF to do that work as soon as the new API gets into production. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you're looking at other approaches to doing code reviews. And can you elaborate on those approaches and maybe indications of where you're leaning towards and what you might recommend? I can't recommend or, or lean, to, I'm not leaning towards anything, but we have evaluated some tools that allow you to, uh, third party tools that allow you to just look at code on an ongoing basis. In retrospect, um, I know Garrett is one of them and I can't remember another name of the tool we've looked at. But they usually plug into, I know there's an Atlassian tool and there's a whole bunch of them that optimize for code review over code management. Unfor I, I can't give you a recommendation on which one is better. How long did it take you guys to start taking the BFF acronym seriously? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know. <laughs> Just a small source sample. People have been using it, yes, seriously, so. It's very funny the first time you say it to someone, though, so it's a recurring joke. You need to create another system, like, that is forever. And then it's like, <laughs> can be the layer on top. Cool. Um, 